As we celebrate Pride and the progress we've made over these past years, there's still work to be done. So to those of you out there who are still working against equal rights, we have a message for you. You think we're sinful? You fight against our rights? You say we all lead lives you can't respect? But you're just frightened? You think that we'll corrupt your kids if our agenda goes unchecked? Funny, just this once, you're correct. We'll convert your children. Happens bit by bit, quietly and subtly, and you will barely notice it. You can keep them from disco, warn about San Francisco. Make him wear pleated pants, we don't care. We'll convert your children. We'll make them tolerant and fair. At first I didn't get why you'd be so scared of us turning your children into accepting, caring people, but I see now why you'd have a problem with that. Just like you worried, they'll change their group of friends. You won't approve of where they go at night. Protest. Oh, and you'll be disgusted so gross. when they start finding things online that you've kept far from their sight. Like information. Guess what? You'll, you'll still, still be, be alright. We'll convert your children. Yes, we will. Reaching one and all, there's really no escaping it. Cause even grandma likes RuPaul. And the world's getting kinder. Gen Z's gayer than grinder. Learn to love, learn to vogue, face your fate. We'll convert your children. Someone's gotta teach them not to hate. church. It's Pride Month, and throughout Pride Month this year, I felt compelled to give a response to Pride Month, and this will be our third week in doing this. This was a message from the San Francisco Gay Men's Choir. They considered it a parody, but it's full of truth. I've heard their agenda straight from their own mouths, and that's exactly what they're trying to do, is indoctrinate our children. Someone once said the homosexual movement can't grow by biological replication, so instead it puts emphasis on ideological indoctrination. It is so true. It is true, and that's why we are discussing these issues. That's why we have to discuss this in church. It's an important issue, and we need to deal with it straight on, head on, all right? And let me give you another example, another example of truth being misinterpreted, misaligned, and that can do lots of damage. Watch this. Are all the transphobic Christians gone? Okay. Jesus was trans. Look like this. To be born male, you have to have an X and a Y chromosome. There's other presenting combinations other than XY, but we're just doing XY right now, okay? Y chromosomes can only come from a male sperm. Mary didn't have sex with a male, which leaves us with Mary only being able to pass on XX chromosomes. Therefore, Jesus was born female, but goes around the entire Bible and everyone calls him him and a male. So he's trans. 
the more you know. Shooting star. I'm getting a little tired of all the mockery of Jesus, the disrespect, and the sacrilegious things. I try to be as sensitive as possible. Someone even recently was wondering if this was a gay affirming church because I was being a little too sensitive. But yet, they're very overt and abrupt in their messaging. And, and rude, I feel. I feel. Someone you love that is struggling with it, all of a sudden, your thinking goes crazy. All of a sudden, you become a lot more sensitive and a lot more accepting. And you did, you'll do things that you never thought possible in the past. So I'm here to continue to educate your children. I'm here to educate you. And I'm here to prepare us for the moments in the future where we're going to have to stand for truth. It is important that we do this. I'm preaching this message because we have to push back darkness and we have to protect our kids and we need to uphold godly values. We honor men today that are fulfilling God's role in their lives. And we pray that we can continue that. I want to welcome those that are watching online. Hopefully this is a blessing to you, whether you're watching live or on replay. I also want to encourage everybody, if you want to follow along with a digital sermon outline, there'll be a lot of information and and scriptures in there that you can go back to and refer to and have conversations with, uh, with people in regards to it, or even just rehearse it on your own. So I'm going to encourage you to do that in the YouVersion Bible app. Just hit the more button and then... uh, and then uh, events, and then our church name. And then press save. You've got to press save before you end the session so that you can go back to that in your archives. In part one, we talked about the guidelines, right? We talked about why we have to talk about this and how we have to talk about this, right? In part two, last week, we talked about the downfall. Paul expressed to us the downfall of society. And it's a result of pride. And it's amazing that this community has latched on to that word, pride. It's exactly the the stronghold of this community, which is pride, which is, what is pride? Pride is doing what we want to do, not what God wants to do. It's what we want to do. It's, it's It's the source of all sin. Every one of us, there's homosexual pride, there's heterosexual pride, and pride says, I want to do things my way instead of God's way. And it's the downfall of a society. Listen, And today, I want to strictly, in part three, I want to talk about the truth. We're going to dive into Scripture. We're going to see what Scripture says about uh, the homosexual lifestyle and about transgenderism and, and other things along the way. And listen, this is not because I'm a homophobic or a transphobic or anything like that. I'm a person of love, and I will respect and honor every human being with breath in their lungs, no matter who they are. But the truth needs to be declared. And, and, and where, what is truth? Truth is the Word of God. So we're going to go to the Word, and we're going to see what the Word of God has to say. All right? And uh, let me start out with a few foundational principles that you need to know. Straightforward facts about Scripture. Number one, the Bible's overwhelming theme for relationships is heterosexual. It is. The overwhelming theme for relationships is heterosexual. Scripture never teaches us to do what feels right, but to do what is right. The reason why we're struggling and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Jumping down to verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. All right, a couple things we can gather through that opening passage speaking about God creating gender and marriage. We are made in the image and the likeness of God, and we are His image bearers. 
That is what we are. God, having God's image means that we are fashioned to resemble and represent God on this earth. And we have the capacity to be in relationship with God. That's what that means to be in his image. And why else would the devil want to interrupt and to destroy this that God set up? Because we are the exact image of Christ and the way he created us gives us opportunity to have a relationship with him. The devil wants to destroy that. He gave two genders, male and female. And he gave them a job, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. That job is only capable of being accomplished when you have a male and a female that come together. Isn't that correct? Only heterosexuals can do this. So while I do want to be sensitive um, through this sermon series, I thought I can share a meme uh, and just have a little bit of fun because it it is truth. It says this, don't forget to thank a straight person this month for your existence. True, guys. Verse 31 said, God saw his creation was good. God evaluated it and he said, this is it. No revisions needed. I didn't make any mistakes. This is perfect. This is my will. Now flesh it out. Moving on in Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 22, it says, Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. And she uh, was taken out of a man. That is why, that is why a man leaves his father and his mother and is united to his wife and the two become one flesh. At the moment of creation, God could have chosen anything. He could have chosen multiple things. He could have given options, but he did one thing. He created man. From man, he created woman, and he commanded them to come together and become one. They come together, one, emotionally and spiritually and in many different ways, relationally, but ultimately they come together physically because there's corresponding parts that allow them to fulfill the purpose of why God brought them together, to be fruitful and to multiply. There are two genders, man and woman, but the world has now confused it. Sex and gender now are separated, and that's why we have confusion. Sex is the biological parts that you were assigned at birth. And gender is what you eventually determine is your identity. All right? So you might be born with traditional male parts, but we're going to give you some time, and at some point you can determine if that's how you want to identify. You could be born with female parts, and that would be your, your sex assigned at birth. But now, your gender is you can de- determine whether you agree with that assignment or whether you feel something else. All right? And that's what we're talking about. Gender identity is not truth. It's a feeling. I'm going to prove to you that through stuff here in just a minute. I went online to try to find a list of genders. And it's, it's fluid. It's constantly changing. But I did find one with 81 different genders. The church needs to take back creativity from the world. That's all I'm saying. you got to be creative to come up with 81 different genders. God is not a God of confusion. It says that in 1 Corinthians 14.33. He is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So the very fact that your feelings are incongruent with your assignment at birth, who gave you that? Who assigned it at birth? God formed you in the womb, right? And, and, And that assignment should be congruent with your feelings. And if it's not, it's confusion. And confusion does not come from God. So who does it come from? The two become one. It's because of God's plan and God's design. And they're encouraged to have children after they are married. Let me give you another solid point. Are you ready? Sex is designed for only one group of people. 
Sex is designed for only one group of people, a man and a woman. And there's more. A man and a woman who are in the covenant of marriage. It's the only group that are allowed to partake in the wonderful creation of sex. It's the only people. Not two people that love each other. Not people of the same gender. Not two people trying to make each other feel good or looking for companionship or just trying to sow your wife. It doesn't matter. There's only one group of people that sex is valid. A man and a woman in the covenant of marriage. I didn't come up with that. If it was me, enjoy! Enjoy! See, it doesn't really matter what I say, what God says, people are going to enjoy anyway. That's the world. That's Christians. That's everybody. Because it's down, it's about our fleshly desires, passions, feelings. We're all born broken. We're all born with a sinful thing. If we weren't born in sin, then we would want to do what aligns with God's plan and His will. But every one of us are born. Every one of us are born broken and with a sinful condition. And we need to come to God and repent of those sins and then ask Him to help us and empower us. And He says, I'll even fill you with the Holy Spirit to empower you on a daily basis to become self-control and to fulfill my will. Every one of us, whether you're heterosexual or homosexual, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to be honoring to God. Amen? Amen. Now, this is Old Testament. This is all the way back thousands of years of creation. But thousands of years in the future, Jesus is asked about marriage. And he refers back to Genesis for the answers. Let's read about it in Matthew 19. Starting in verse 3, And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him and asked, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And this is Jesus' response, not up on the screen, but in the Bible and on my iPad, it's red. Starting in verse 4 and beyond, He answered, Jesus answered, and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? Reaffirming gender assignments. And said, who, who, who did it? God did it. God created it. It was his plan, his purpose. Thousands of years later, after creation now, Jesus is reiterating back to Genesis 1 and saying this was the plan and it's still the plan. Verse 5, and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. Just repeating everything we just read. And the two shall become one flesh, right? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Jesus went back to Genesis to help us understand the foundations uh, and guidelines of marriage. He validated the Genesis account of marriage and gender. Now, some people say Jesus never said anything about homosexuality. And while there is no scripture recorded, Jesus could have spoken about it, but in scripture, nothing is recorded about Jesus speaking directly against uh, homosexuality or, or transgenderism for that, for, for that matter. But everything he did say about marriage, which is quite a bit, is all in the context of a heterosexual relationship and male and female. So while he didn't speak directly to it, he, he spoke indirectly to it by telling us what gender is and what marriage is, right? And in addition, went on to um, condemn divorce, uh, which later he, he goes on to say that is only good uh, in the sense, not good, but permissible uh, in the sense when that marriage covenant has been broken through that marriage unfaithfulness. Now, God knows that our children are better off with their biological mom and dad. I did a lot of research and came up with a lot of different um, studies, and all of them point to the same thing. Kids are better off with their biological mother and father. Now, that's homosexuality is not the only thing interfering with that. This is a broader issue. So if you're here today and, and, and you have a 
family, a mom and a dad and children, count that a blessing and thank God. If you're a child and you have a mother and a father present, thank God. If you're a father and a mother and you have children within the home, recognize the intense responsibility that is upon us to raise our children in the way that they should go. And I also recognize that there's many people here that their their children no longer live in the home, but I pray that you're still an influence in the lives of even your adult children. According to one report in a 2015 study by Princeton University, it says this, children who are raised by their married biological parents enjoy better physical, cognitive, and emotional outcomes on average than children raised in other circumstances. Researchers have been able to make a strong case that marriage has causal impacts on outcomes such as children's schooling, their social and emotional adjustment, and their employment, marriage, and mental health as adults. God knows what he's doing. If you follow the rules, you get the rewards. If you do what he asks you to do and follow the principles of Scripture, you'll, you'll, you'll get maximum benefit from the Creator. Now, the devil is always looking to push the limits, always trying to attack the family. So he also has another angle. Have you ever heard of sologamy? Take a look at this slide. People can now marry themselves. Oh, yeah. The ceremony was held so she could marry herself. Look at this book, I Pledge to Marry Myself, from Oscar Wilde, a quote, to love oneself is the beginning of a lifelong romance. Uh, one of the uh, top scholars that I, I follow uh, pretty closely is Dr. Michael Brown. He said, when we said years ago that once you redefine marriage, anything goes, we were mocked and vilified. Today's stories like this, talking about women marrying themselves, called sologamy, are no big deal. How about that, guys? Again, you, you, you continue to see, and, and some people do this as a joke just to say uh, it's an expression and a celebration of self-love. But come on, guys. <laughs> the, why are we talking about this? I've got to go back to week one. There, there is a demonic influence in the world and it is trying to rip apart everything that God has created and calls holy. And again, I don't mean to be vicious or rude, but I thought this was interesting. Somebody sent me this next picture, and uh, like, oh, Pride Month. Look at that. Oh, you heard it right here, guys. There's a demon. All of you are demon. No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not telling anybody that they're demonic or anything like that, but is there demonic influence in all of this? 100%. And let me just kick this up a notch. And again, the church has to talk about this stuff because it's coming from the highest levels of leadership in our, in our country and in our world. And it's going to be very tough for people to reject the messaging. Go to the next picture. The pride flag was recently uh, hung at the White House. I truly believe that when leaders speak, it's powerful. When a father declares something over his family or over his marriage, very powerful, right? When, when a pastor declares something over his church and says this is what we're doing, very powerful, when a, when a mayor and city leadership declare something over a city, it's very powerful. It's powerful what the leaders are saying. Well, guys, in the United States, this is what our leaders are saying and declaring over our nation. Even though it's against Scripture, it's against truth, it's against what we've known for millennia, and accept it as truth, now the top levels of our government are promoting and celebrating this. And you're going to find out that that does not bode well for that particular country. I'll give you scriptural proof. In a speech on the South Long, the president claims that the bills aim to protect children from sex change procedures before adulthood 
are an attack on the child's freedom. Mm. Biden said his administration is doing everything they can to advance equality for the LGBTQ community in our nation. Let me give you a little bit of good news after I just ripped your heart out. Missouri, we have a governor who's a Christian, Governor Mike Parsons. And recently he signed Senate Bill 39, this is very recent, and Senate Bill 49. Let me tell you what they are. SB 39 prohibits educational institutions from allowing biological male students from participating on sports teams designated for biological females. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Mike Parsons, for being a Christian that believes the Word of God is true and receiving the call of God on your life to lead a a state in the way that they should go to be honoring to God. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. We need more people in politics and in leadership that will advance the kingdom of God and that will uphold godly values in this world. I appreciate him doing this. That was SB 39. SB 49 establishes the Missouri Safe Adolescent from Experimentation Act. That's SAFE, S-A-F-E. The SAFE Act prohibits health care providers from performing gender transition surgeries or prescribing hormones or drugs for the, propo- uh, uh, for the purposes of gender transition to Missouri children under the age of 18. So he's saying over 18, you're an adult, you can make your own decision, but we're going to prohibit uh, that from happening to kids under 18. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Governor. He said he signed these bills into law in an effort to protect the unity of female sports and Missouri children from potentially harmful experimental surgeries and treatments. Appreciate somebody at least acting with a level head and common sense, but of course, grounded in the truth of the Word of God. In preparation for the sermon series, I have indulged in articles, books, and also videos. And one of the documentaries that I I watched was uh, one that you might be familiar with. It's called What is a Woman? It was produced by Matt Walsh, and he's from The Daily Wire. And you could only watch this hour and a half documentary uh, with a subscription to The Daily Wire, which is a couple dollars a month. However, I heard that you can stream it uh, in its entirety on Twitter, and that was true. So if you would just... um, uh, Search on Twitter, what is a woman documentary? Uh, up will come links and you can watch it. Uh, me and my family watched it. Uh, there, it, There is uh, just a few segments with some questionable language and things like that, but um, sometimes you have to endure junk. Uh, and um, so I wouldn't let your little, little kids watch it, but uh, I, I would encourage you to watch it. It's an hour and a half documentary where Matt Walsh is just simply... Um, Asking questions, questions to professionals in education, medicine, and psychology. And the simple question is, what is a woman? And for an hour and a half, he can't get a straight answer because every person says it's something different to whoever, right? Because sex and gender are now separated, gender is not defined very well. So people say that they're women, but they don't really know what that means at this point now. They don't know what it means. And I I think it's funny, though, that males that want to transition to females end up acting and looking and dressing like what we would know as a traditional female. But they disregard traditional definitions. But when a man becomes a female, he wants to be, look like, sound like a traditional female. Right? Right? I was going to go somewhere else, but I don't have time. Um... I believe that it's okay, guys, for, for some men to have some feminine qualities. And I think it's okay for some women to have some masculine qualities. Right? We don't have to then say, oh, because, you know, I like to cook instead of tackle somebody and shed blood, that, that I might be gay. Or 
I rather play sports than play dolls. I might be a lesbian. That's not true. There's differences. Everybody is different. My wife couldn't hit a ball if, you know, whatever. Yeah. But, <laughs> but there are some women. No, she's actually, she could actually throw a ball pretty good and maybe with a wiffle bat she could hit. But anyway, there are some women that are better than me at sports. That does not make them a lesbian. It just makes them good at sports. It's all right. It's all right. But I also think it's up to the parents to help navigate them through that. Let our parents navigate through that. The truth according to Scripture is this. There are two genders, and they are male and female. Those are distinguished. This is how you know. They're distinguished by different but complementary genitalia. It's the way it is. There's no question about this, and it's been the standard for millennia. Our society is recognizing people's feelings as truth. They're recognizing people's feelings as truth and reinforcing those feelings. Now, this is where it gets tough with chemical castration and surgical mutilation of the body. The church needs to talk about this, and we need to push back against it. Thank you, Governor Mike Parsons, a, a believer, for, for protecting our kids at least. Because oftentimes, after puberty hits and they have some years to think about it, their decisions are different. The problem is it doesn't matter who they are, what age they are. It doesn't even matter if undeveloped children feel this way. The world is saying we can't question their feelings. But let me tell you the problem with that. We have a daycare and preschool here at our, our church, as you know, and we just had preschool graduation. And every year we do a, a, an interview with each of the kids and we ask them what they want to be when they grow up, among other questions. And one of the questions, uh, uh, or, or yeah, that's one of the questions, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they're always silly, cute, you know, some are, make no sense. This year, we had one kid that wanted to grow up and be a dolphin and one kid that wanted to grow up and be a mermaid. It's probably not going to happen. But we're laughing and saying, <laughs> that's cute, these kids are so funny. Why didn't you go, <gasps> what are you guys teaching them? That they would want to cross species lines? <laughs> Be a hybrid? Hybrid mermaid? What are you doing? You know why we didn't do that? Because kids don't have a real good touch on reality just yet. They're not fully developed. They're just figuring it out. One kid said he wanted to be a school bus. <laughs> Not driver, school bus. And it's cute. Let them mature and grow up and understand what reality is and come to grips with some things in their lives and then they can make some life-altering and permanent decisions. You know the story of Logan Brown? You know him? Her? I'm so confused at this point. <laughs> I am a pregnant trans man, and I do exist. No matter what anybody says, I'm living proof. On the cover of Glamour magazine, cover of June Pride Month, this trans man is pregnant. Proud, trans, and pregnant. And I do exist. I'm living proof. You're living proof that a woman can get pregnant even if you're pretending to be a man. Amen. I'm not dumb, guys. You're not pulling the wool over my eyes. This is a woman pretending to be a man. There's nothing special about this. But there is something unnatural, unnatural and wrong. As Scripture puts it, unnatural. This is not the way it's supposed to be unnatural and it's called gender dysphoria according to the Mayo Clinic gender dysphoria is a feeling of discomfort or distress that might occur in people whose gender identity differs from their sex assigned at birth or sex related physical characteristics the term focuses on discomfort as the problem rather than identity 
And then it goes through a list of ways that you can be diagnosed with gender dysphoria. Has nothing to do with truth. Has nothing to do with fact. It has nothing to do with science. From the Mayo Clinic website, any two of these you'll be you'll be uh, dis, uh, labeled with uh, as gender dysphoria when you have a difference between gender identity and your biological identities or realities. So this is how they word it. A strong desire to be rid of these genitalia, and it goes on, I'm shortening it. A strong desire to have the genitals of another gender. A strong desire to be treated like another gender. And a strong belief of having the typical feelings and reactions of other genders. Um, it's just a feeling. A year or two ago, I said, what, what's going to happen when people identify as other, like, like a cat? Are we going to put a, a kitty litter box in the, in the bathrooms at school? Guys, we, we do. We have furries. We have people that are identifying as animals. God said that he has created us in the image of God and we have the dominion over animals, but people are now identifying as animals. And fairies, your pronouns would be fee and fey. Guys, it's demonic, it's perverted, it's twisted, and it's a mockery of God's creation and trying to mar those who are bearing the image of God. So it's not about homophobia, transphobia. I have total 100% comfort being in the same room, being in relationship with people from this community doesn't bother me one bit. But your strong feelings is not truth. The Word of God is truth. And I am continually going to declare that so that our, can, our kids can hear it, you can hear it, grandparents can hear it because you get soft in your old age and you just want to love on your grandkids and you don't want to fight the fight, we're going to need you to fight the fight. Amen. We're going to need you to fight the fight. People are giving gender-affirming care now. Kids come with these feelings and they're not there to talk them out of it or to assess, but to affirm. States are outlawing any kind of conversion therapy or any, any conversations that would try to dissuade somebody from departing from their feelings. Guys, when are our feelings supposed to rule anyone? This is not even a biblical concept. Any leadership concept, any, anybody with common sense would realize that our, our feelings are not right. We go through a lot of different things, and this is what we'll talk about next week. There's a lot of other factors that cause me to believe things about myself and give me feelings that are not of God. And I've got to bring them to prayer. I've got to bring them to prayer and find out who my identity is in God. All right? All right. I got a little bit more for you. You still with me? All right. I know these are long, but do you want to talk about this for eight weeks? I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to do this as fast as I can, maybe probably 10 minutes, and then we're going to close in prayer, right? Thank you for hanging with me. Scripture speaks a great deal about sexuality. All right. But listen, homosexu homosexuality is not the only sin that matters when it comes to sexual purity. There's heterosexual sins that also need to be addressed. And through Scripture, these are in your outline, there's pornography, prostitution, human trafficking, cohabitation, fornication, adultery, and the new excitement, open marriages, swingers, spouse swapping, other terms for adultery, Scripture throughout forbids us to be sexually involved with seven different groups of people. Seven different groups, all right? Number one, parents. Two, children. Three, siblings. Four, someone else's spouse. Five, animals. Ooh, gross. Guys, 
I'll be talking about this next year. This week, there was a professor from Penn State caught with his dog. I don't want to have to say that from up here, and I'm sorry, and I hope that doesn't stick with you for the remainder of the day, but is what it is. Sin is here. And the moment you begin to deviate from God's plan, you open up the floodgates to everything. So animals, dead people, I'm not even going there today. Finally, same sex. I'm going to go back to the Old Testament. Leviticus 18 gives a list of unlawful sexual relations. A list, a list of them. We're going to deal with when he talks about homosexual practice and beyond. And I want, to li- want you to listen to some things. Leviticus 18, verse 22. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. And you shall not lie with any, other, with any animal and so make yourself unclean with it. Neither shall any woman give herself to an animal to lie with it. It is a perversion. Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, for by all these the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean, and the land become, became unclean, so that I punished its iniquity, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you shall keep my statutes and my rules, and do none of these abominations, either the native or the stranger or sojourner among you. For the people of the land who were before you, did all of these abominations so that the land became unclean. Lest the land vomit you out uh, when you make it unclean as it vomited out the nation that was before you. I need to make a couple of comments about this passage of Scripture. I'll dive into this a little bit more, answering specific questions next week. We're going to go back to Leviticus and when God is giving sexual purity laws. He obviously makes it very clear a man should not... Lie with a man like he does with a woman. Vice versa, whatever, whatever. Oftentimes people will take that isolated verse, verse 18 or 22, and, and, and say it's the Old Testament, it doesn't apply. And I don't have time to go into all this. But the Old Testament doesn't apply to Christians these days, right? Or it only applied to Israel. It only applied to Israel, right? It doesn't apply to everybody of all times and all things like this, right? Well, if you just read a couple of more verses it answers some of those questions. First of all, Old Testament law was given. There was different levels of it. There were ceremonial laws, and there were laws that were just given to cause Israel themselves to be separate from other nations. That's where we get some of the dietary laws, like no pork, or, or, or you can't wear uh, clothing with mixed fabric, and things like that, right? But then there was moral laws. And they were for people of all times. And they were most of the time reiterated in the New Testament under the New Covenant. But one of the big things here is that this is for the people, God's people, Israel. That's what these laws are for. But if you continue reading on to verse 24, it says, Do not make for yourselves unclean unclean by any of these things. For by all these the nations I am driving out before you have done and become unclean. And that's why I'm driving them out. The Gentile nations, the pagan nations that were that that God was giving them their land in the promised land. God was going to drive them all out. Why? For breaking his law that he just described in Leviticus, right here, well, chapter 18. It was for everybody. It was not only for Israel, it was for the surrounding nations. And they did not follow them. So God drove them out. And it says the land became cursed and it spit out its inhabitants. Homosexuality is an abomination to God. We read that in Scripture. And the land that receives it and practices it will be judged. There you go. Moving on, Leviticus 20, two chapters later, verse 13, it's reiterated. If a man lies with a male, as with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood is upon them. This this warrant at the death penalty in uh, the Old Testament. I know I just told you that Old Testament law still applies, but we do things a little bit differently now. Praise the Lord. You happy about that? I don't have time to explain all that. Leviticus 20, starting in verse 22. You shall, 
Never mind. You shall therefore keep all my statutes and all my rules and do them that the land where I'm bringing to you to live may not vomit you out. And you shall not walk in the customs of the nations that I am driving out before you. For they did all these things and therefore I detested them. These are passages of scripture where people would hang up a sign and say, God hates fags. Seems to have scriptural evidence. He's not saying he hates the individual. He's hating the act. He abhors the act. And as a result of that act, they have become unholy and unacceptable to God, which is where all of our sin causes us all to be. But under the new covenant, there's grace and forgiveness to the blood of Jesus. If not, the death penalty is still in play. You will die in your sin and you will live in eternity separated from God in hell. But we do have another alternative option. Praise the Lord. His attitude hasn't changed towards this. We've got to move on. Moving over to the New Testament, I'm almost done. After Paul talked about the downward spiral of society in Romans 1, I talked about this last week. I'm not going to reiterate it, but I gave you a, 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 a pathway on how to destroy a, a society. Look back in your notes. After he said, this is how you do it, and people give up natural affections and they turn their eyes from the creator and they place it on his creation. Then, very next verses are what I'm going to read to you right now. Romans 1, 26 and 7. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. He backed off and let them do what they wanted to do. Even then, uh, even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. It's what happens. It's what happens. When you don't follow God's rules, there's, there's things that will, will come and bite you in the butt. Literally. Ah. Just came up with that on my own. Why is there sexually transmitted diseases? Because you're outside of God's plan and purpose. I like to watch the game show network with my family. We watch different game shows. That's what we do. We like to build our brains. Every commercial break, there's a commercial about a drug to help people with HIV and AIDS. And we have same-sex couples kissing each other in the commercials. I know how you could not get those. I never got one. Because I obeyed the, the laws of God in His Word. That's what I want for your kids and for your grandkids. Paul goes on and teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He says this, But do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Oh, big question. He's going to now tell us who is ineligible to go to heaven. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the idolaters, nor the adulterers. These are all heterosexual things, by the way. Nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. We need to take the, we need to take the word of God at its word. I want to end today by giving you hope. And again, we'll give you a lot of hope next week, but I can't get your blood boiling unless I get your faith rising, as Dr. Michael Brown likes to say. I like that. God wants to give you freedom. He offers freedom to people that will come to him. I want to read that passage of Scripture in 1 Corinthians 6 again. Uh, in verse 9 and verse 10, everything we just read, but I want to add verse 11. 
But do you not know that wrongdoers will not be not, not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor the adulterers, or the adulterers, nor the men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, very depressing. Verse 11. And that is what some of you were. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. I was there in Greece and I was taught about the sexual immorality happening. Part of the religious duties was to climb the mountain, the Acro Corinth. When you got to the top, you got to the temple and there were temple prostitutes waiting for you. And this was all about sexual impurity and immorality. And Paul goes there, he tells people about Jesus, they get saved, and he establishes a church, and he writes this letter back to them, and he says, you guys were involved in all kinds of filth, all kinds of sexual perversion, but God saved you, and that's what some of you were. That's what some of you were. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. It is reversible. That is what some of you were. It is not permanent. God can touch you. God can transform you. And I pray that for each and every person. And I don't want to just say like it's going to be just like this. Some people will be delivered just like this. And other people will be a struggle. We'll talk more about this next week. But it is not permanent. People say, I was born this way. There's no scientific proof that anybody is born with homosexuality or gender dysphoria. However, just for the sake of argument, let's say they are. Let's say you're born into sin. Welcome to the club. Welcome to the club. My sinful nature wants to do everything that is contrary to the word of God. And I had to come to a, a point in my life where I said, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to surrender my life to Jesus. And I'm going to ask him to help me every day. I've got to be in prayer and his word every other day. Otherwise, I too might fall. So if you're born that way, you know what God's response is? Well, then be born again. Let me be born again. New start. New start. Go to the next slide. I put these links in uh, your YouVersion outline. You can go to changedmovement.com to hear testimonies of ex-gays. I'll bring this up again next week. Testimonies of sex change regret. You know, after people have done what's permanent. Are they, are they, we, we got to let them do it because it's going to make them happy. But then they're not happy. Doggone it. Sad. Said, but God can change. In conclusion, four things I want you to take away from this. Homosexuality and transgenderism are not biblical alternatives. Nothing but heterosexuality is encouraged in the Bible. Even if people are born this way, we must be born again in Christ. And there is freedom in Jesus. You can be delivered and set free from these desires that don't please the Lord. That's heterosexual desires. That's strong feelings of gender dysphoria. That's heterosexual people that can't keep their pants on. That's heterosexual people that are violating their marriage covenant. That's heterosexual Christians that are not staying pure until they get married. people engaging in pornography. I mean, we're all fallen. We're all fallen. We all need Jesus, but the answer is Jesus. The answer isn't affirm me in my sin so I can feel better. The answer is tell me the truth so I can be set free. And that's what Jesus wants to do. Amen? Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we love you today. We love you today. We praise your name. 
We praise your name. Now, let me just say right up front, we're going to try to do some ministry to people next week. And I think it'll be broad coverage. But if you or, or someone in your family is struggling with this, let me know. The ministry may not take place around these altars for various reasons, right? So we can do that confidentially. We can do that privately. I'll be available to have conversations with you, to meet with you here or someone else, somewhere else, whatever, and walk you through it, help you through it, have times of prayer. I want to offer that to you. Don't struggle by yourself. If, if, if anybody has strong questions about this, and I know I haven't answered all the questions yet. I'm going to try to do my best to answer a, a lot of the important ones next week. But, but if, if you want to even help me in that prep, send, send me some of those questions you might have or ones that you have heard or different things, and I'll try to address those. But don't struggle in isolation and don't allow your children or grandchildren to deal with this and just say, well, I knew it was wrong, but I didn't know what to do, so I just let it go and now it's too late. They need you. And and I'm willing to walk you through it and help you through that. I really am. I really am. I wanted to say that before we got lost in prayer there for a second. Father, thank you for your word that declares your truth. Your truth is black and white. Your truth is easy to understand. And your truth brings freedom. Thank you that in the midst of this world of confusion and the the plans of the enemy to confuse people, and let's call it the way it is, to rob, kill, and destroy, to pick them off, to keep them from being good image bearers of you, In the midst of all of that, you have brought us truth. And we thank you for that. Thank you for that. The most important issue in our lives is where we stand with God. Some of these things in our lives that we struggle with kind of get corrected when we fully surrender over to Jesus. It's certainly where it needs to begin. The Bible said our sin separates us from God. It doesn't make you a bad person because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, every one of us. And without Jesus, we're lost in our sin. And we cannot have a relationship with Him. We are far from Him. In our eternity, when we take, take our last breath, our soul will live on. It would live apart from Jesus in a place called hell. You know all about it. Yeah, it's a literal place. But today you can do something about that sin. You don't ask people to affirm it. You don't get so involved in it that it becomes comfortable and natural to you and then say it's okay. Sin, as outlined in the Bible, is wrong, and God doesn't change his mind on it. Again, it doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you human. But what you do next is of the utmost importance. You must recognize that you're a sinner and that your sin separates you from God, and you must ask God to forgive you. The Bible says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we'll just confess our sin. We go before God and say, yeah, I know that I'm a sinner. I don't care what the world says. I know that I'm a sinner. My my sin separates me from you. You ask him to forgive you. He forgives you. He cleanses you. But that's not the end of your homework. We need to invite Jesus into our lives. And trust Him with our lives. Why? Because that activates what He did on the cross. He took your punishment on the cross 
for your sin. And when you accept Jesus in your life and you trust him with your life, you accept what he did on the cross for you. So your sin debt is paid. It's the only way your sin debt is paid. Then he saves you and he welcomes you into the family of God. And I need to give you opportunity today to receive Jesus. If you're here today and you need to surrender your life to Jesus for the first time or maybe the first time in a long time, would you raise your hand with me today and say, today I choose Jesus? Amen. So again, I want to speak to those that are watching online. I love that we have this opportunity that I get to speak to you. No matter who you are, what you've done, what you might be involved in right now, God loves you, cares for you, and he died for you. And all you have to do is call on him and ask him to forgive you of your sin and to wash you clean and give you a new start. Confess him as your leader and your master. He will welcome you into his family and write your name down in heaven. For that purpose, I want to lead you in a prayer that is just written based on Scripture, the scriptural declarations that we are asked to make. But we need to believe it in our minds and in our hearts. We need to confess it with our mouth. You want to make Jesus the leader and the master of your life today. Let's repeat this prayer together. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. I know that I'm a sinner and that my sin separates me from you. I'm going to take care of that right now. I confess my sin and I ask you to wash me clean and give me a new start. I believe that you died on a cross, were buried in a tomb, 